Hey everyone, Alistair here. Hope you're doing okay. The summer months are upon us, which means two things. I need to wear more hats, and this is the part of our year when costs are high and support tends to dip. We know, believe me, things are tight everywhere at the moment, and unfortunately, that includes us. For those of you who support us already, thank you so much. We hope you're enjoying the great new Cats Cast episodes and all the Pseudopod extrusions. If you don't support us, but you would like to join them, we've got tons of options for you at both Patreon and PayPal. Even a one-off at Kofi makes a big difference. Or, if you're in the market for some sweet new summer wardrobe, we have a new swag store, courtesy of our amazing friends over at Void Merch, and the t-shirts are unbelievably great. It all adds up, it all helps, and it all helps us bring you the best in free audio fiction every week. So, if you can help out, please do, and thanks, and do enjoy this week's episode. Cat's Cast, Episode 5 for August 2022. Daisies by Marshall J. Moore. Hello, and welcome to Cat's Cast, your monthly feline fiction podcast. I'm your editor and host, Laura Perlman. This month, I'm pleased to bring you Daisies by Marshall J. Moore. This story is a Cat's Cast original. Some content notes, grief is a major theme of this story. The story also depicts the peaceful death of a beloved cat. Our author this week is Marshall J. Moore. Marshall J. Moore is a writer, filmmaker, and martial artist born and raised on Kwajalein, a tiny Pacific island. He is trained a professional mercenary in unarmed combat, sold a thousand dollars worth of teapots to Jackie Chan, was once tracked down by a bounty hunter for owing $300 in late fees to the Los Angeles Public Library. An active member of CIFWA, his work has been published by Mysterian, Air and Nothingness Press, Flame Tree, and many others. He lives in Atlanta, Georgia with his wife Megan and their two cats. Twitter at Quaj14, Instagram at Quaj Marshall, Facebook, Facebook.com slash Quaj Marshall. Marshall said this about his cats. My cats, Delilah and Furiosa, are the sweetest kitties in the world. Delilah is the best companion, so silently unobtrusive you don't realize she's been sitting next to you for an hour until she starts purring. Furiosa is the most physically affectionate cat imaginable. She wakes my wife and I up every morning with nuzzles and cuddles, often much earlier than we'd prefer. Our narrator this week is S.K. Nash. S.K. Nash is an occasional writer, narrator, and bibliophile. Raised by a cabal of university professors, anthropologists, and librarians, she holds two degrees as magical wards to protect her from being hauled back into the ivory tower. Her short fiction has appeared in several anthologies, including Roadkill 2 Texas Horror by Texas Writers. She lives in Texas with a mad scientist, her books, and her cats. Follow her at NashChick on Twitter. That's Nash with a G. SK said this about her cats. I am a devoted servant to two feline overlords. Ghost Cat is a small incorporeal being with white and brown fur who can be seen only by her servants. She is occasionally captured by photographs. Round Cat is the color of tarnished silver. She is big and brash and bossy, and yes ma'am, I'll be right there with your wet food. Now tend your garden and listen closely, because there's something we need to tell you. Daisies by Marshall J. Moore Narrated by S.K. Nash I believe I was the only person on earth who stayed outdoors on that golden evening watching the world end. The bombs rose from the far horizon like stars ascending to greet the night. Our bombs, or at least the ones with old glory painted on their sides, soon they would descend, falling like avenging angels onto some lonely hilltop on the far side of the planet. 
I imagined a woman exactly like me in every respect save language and ethnic background watching them fall, knowing what was about to happen. I felt sorry for her. I wondered who stood to gain from killing the whole world. The cockroaches, maybe? The other bombs fell scarcely an hour later. The golden sky had turned to purple, royal colors. It was just dark enough to watch as they streaked across the night, a quintet of stars falling to earth, so bright that it hurt my eyes to watch them. But I did not look away. I did not hide from the bombs or the death they brought with them. There was nothing to hide from. I had buried Daisy the day before. "'Don't put me in a cemetery,' Daisy had said one night near the end, as I held her paper-thin hand in mine. I lived my whole life refusing to be boxed in, and I'll be damned if I spend my death the same way. She had been a woman of vibrant, joyous contradiction, my Daisy. Military veteran and ardent pacifist, punk rocker and upstanding citizen, literary critic, and B-movie junkie. Early in our courtship, I had poked fun at her steadfast defiance of all convention. Daisy had smiled at me and quoted Whitman, telling me that if she contradicted herself, then she contradicted herself. "'I am large,' she had proclaimed, lying propped up on one elbow in my queen-sized bed. She plucked a dark chocolate from the tin that lay between us and popped it into her mouth, eyes closing in quiet rapture. "'I contain multitudes.' "'If you keep eating those chocolates, you will be.' Daisy whacked me in the head with a pillow. Soon the tin of chocolates lay forgotten on the floor. That night I tasted the bittersweet cocoa on her lips and knew I would be hers forever. Don't put me in a cemetery, she had told me, and so I hadn't. Instead, I laid my wife to rest in our garden, out behind the little cottage that was our home. Our garden, Daisy had called it. But in any marriage, certain things become the provenance of one party or the other, and the garden was assuredly daisies. She grew tomatoes and turnips, sprouts and spinach. Any plant her green thumb touched grew fruitful and multiplied. But the flowers were her favorites. They grew in clusters around the garden's edges, thorny yellow roses, delicate pink peonies, lovely lilies, romantic begonias, and, of course, daisies. I buried my wife beside her namesake. It had rained the night before, and their white petals glistened with dew. I wore Daisy's faded pair of denim overalls. The mud squelched under my rubber boots, and each shovelful came loose from the earth with a heavy, protesting belch. By the time I was finished, my back ached, and my hands were raw with blisters, the overalls so caked with mud that their original color could only be guessed at. I carried the body that had once been Daisy's from our cottage to the grave I had dug for her. I had always loved the comfortable weight of her lying atop me, but in my arms she felt no heavier than a feather. If I let her go, she might float away. I kissed her one last time on her cold brow, laid her in the wet earth, and covered her with a cloth. One shovelful at a time, I replaced the mud I had disturbed, until only a small patch of damp ground remained to show where I had laid her to rest. Only then did I wipe the dirt from my torn hands and open the battered leather book of poetry Daisy had asked me to read from. I bequeath myself to the dirt, to grow from the grass I love. I swallowed hard. If you want me again, look for me under your boot soles. The funeral had only one other mourner. Clementine was an old cat, well past fifteen. Once she had been black as coal, but the years had grayed the fur around her mouth and eyes. She watched from the bushes as I buried Daisy, green eyes glinting between the branches. Only when I had smoothed the last of the mud over the grave did she emerge, twining around my legs, gently purring. She missed her mother. Clementine and I were old friends, but Daisy had been her mother, just as the garden had been Daisy's more than mine. 
She had brought Clementine back from the shelter a week after our wedding, a quivering ball of black fur small enough to sit in my hand. It was our first fight as a married couple. I was angry that she had adopted a cat, and angrier that she had done so without consulting me. We had only just bought the cottage. We had talked about getting a pet, but not so soon, not when we had scarcely moved any of our furniture in. Daisy apologized. She acknowledged that she hadn't thought, explained she had been driving past the shelter and, on impulse, gone in. When she walked out, it was with the tiny puff of midnight fur in her arms. "'Take her,' she had said, pressing the kitten into my unwilling hands. Bright green eyes stared unafraid at me from the small dark face. Clementine yawned, displaying a mouthful of sharp little fangs, and licked my hand with her rough pink tongue. I knew then, just as I had known when I kissed Daisy, that I could not part from this small creature. After the world ended, I did nothing but lay in bed all day long, and the day after, and the one after that. I was tired, but I did not sleep. It was not that sort of tiredness. I simply lay there, thinking little and doing less. I was waiting. Neither hunger nor thirst moved me. I felt them only distantly, as though they were someone else's needs, not my own. My body's needs were unimportant. It was just a machine. The thing inside it, the one that thought and felt and called itself I, had been buried with Daisy. That's how it is when you lose the one you love. They are gone, and they take the parts of you that you gave to them when they go. When the one you love most is gone, the greater part of yourself goes with her. I laid in bed, the day after the world ended, two days after my world had ended. I lay there, and I waited. A scratching at the cottage door penetrated the depths of my fugue. I groaned and half sat up, disoriented. I had lost all sense of time, but daylight shone through the cottage window. The scratching came again, frantic and insistent, accompanied by a high and yowling whine. Clementine, meowing piteously at the door. Panic pierced my fog, the first real feeling I had felt since burying Daisy. Clementine was a quiet cat by nature. We'd heard her meow only a handful of times in the decade and a half that she had lived with us. Daisy used to joke that when Clementine finally decided to speak, she would talk to us in perfect English. But now, Clementine was on the other side of the cottage door, mewling with all the breath in her old lungs. She might be hurt, maybe badly hurt. My knees protested as I stood, unused to bearing my full weight after days abed. The world spun and tilted crazily. The reality of dehydration took its toll, and I fell hard against the wall. If I had fallen to the floor, I might never have gotten up. I leaned there, waiting until the world ceased its madcap spinning. Then I stumbled into the kitchen, keeping one hand on the wall. I poured myself a glass of water and forced myself to drink it slowly. Too fast, and I would only throw it back up. Clementine's mewling had risen to a fever pitch, demanding and panicked. Feeling stronger, I walked unsteadily to the door. She sat on the porch looking primly up at me, tail wrapped around her paws. A small massacre surrounded her. Chipmunks, field mice, even a sparrow. I looked down at Clementine. She blinked at me slowly. "'Is this all for me?' I asked looking at the tiny bodies strewn across the porch. Clementine yawned and trotted inside. I closed the door after her. Then I sat down at the kitchen table and ate a brown-speckled banana, giving into my body's insistence that I feed it. I ate slowly, and I thought. Without Daisy, there had seemed to be little point to anything. Why continue when the best and greatest part of my life had departed? I had expected to die when the bombs fell. I had known they were coming, had stood outside to greet them. It would have been so easy to meet my end at the same time as everyone else, 
to allow that final blast to rid me of the dull ache that had eclipsed my entire self. But that had not happened. The cottage was too remote, too isolated from any of the major urban centers that would have been primary targets. Even the smaller secondary weapons that had peppered the countryside with noxious clouds had not reached me until their toxins dissipated. Others may have survived, but my nearest neighbors were miles away. So I had laid there, waiting for the end that had not come. But Clementine still needed me. Not for food, the smorgasbord of dead animals showed she could provide for herself, but she had not eaten them. She had placed them at my doorstep, knowing I was hungry. As I finished my banana, Clementine hopped into my lap, purring loudly. I stroked her absently behind the ears, and she leaned into my hand, nuzzling her cheeks against my fingers. I resolved silently, then and there, that I would survive, for Clementine's sake. It took me a week to regain my strength. I spent that time eating canned soup and making plans. Planning was a comfort to me. In my life before, I had taken pleasure in the careful ordering of my affairs, the diligent checking of boxes and crossing items off lists. I had believed life's uncertainties could be kept at bay through systems and plans. I had stopped believing that when Daisy got sick, but even the illusion of control gave me a measure of peace. At least now I could decide whether to die or try to live. That was more than most people had gotten. So I made plans. I started with a detailed inventory of our pantry, organizing food according to expiration dates. Canned goods I set aside, knowing they would last the longest. There was no longer any electricity, so I spent an hour throwing everything out of my refrigerator. My pantry would last me a few weeks, months if I ate sparingly. Much of what I had could be supplemented with vegetables from the garden, which would need constant tending. Every morning I would clear away the weeds and dead foliage, tending to the plants as diligently as Daisy had. I lacked her green thumb, but you could not be married to a gardener without picking up a basic working knowledge of the trade. At the end of the week, when my strength had returned, I went into town. Clementine followed me to the wooden gate that marked our property line, then wandered off into the bushes. I shouldered my backpack and set off down the dirt lane. Our cottage was nestled in the hills, two hours' walk from town, but it felt good to stretch my legs and breathe the fresh air. Birds chirped and chittered in the trees, and for a time I nearly forgot that the world had ended, until I came across the bodies. There is nothing I can say about the death of the human race that will give any solace. No description of the corpses will ease the passing of their souls, so I will speak of them as little as possible. I will say only that I could smell them long before I saw them, that most were entombed in their cars or indoors, and that mercifully few lay in the streets, that the sight of the first one set bile rising in my throat, but that within the hour I had grown accustomed to the horrors that it surprised me how resilient the mind is and how quickly it can make the unspeakable seem commonplace. I went directly to the local grocery store. Armed with a flashlight, I made my way past the thing that sat behind the cash register and down the darkened aisles. A rotting smell was already rising from the produce section, so I went instead to the canned goods, loading as many tins into my backpack as I could. A crash echoed in the still darkness. My heart hammered its way up into my throat, and the flashlight fell from my numb fingers, rolling away into the dark. My heart raced. It had been foolish to assume I was the only survivor, and I was unarmed and utterly alone. The flashlight rolled to a stop, its beam reflected off a pair of mirror-like eyes glowing green in the dark. Their owner yowled and sprang away, offended. I breathed a sigh of relief. When I left the grocery, it was with two dozen cans of cat food. All cats know that the world belongs and has always belonged to them. The annihilation of the human race merely made it official. 
Wary by nature, they observed me only from a safe distance. I glimpsed them as pairs of glittering eyes peering out from a darkened doorway, or fluffy tails disappearing between the hedgerows as I made my way through town. The library was next on my list. Years of marriage to Daisy had given me some rudimentary skill at gardening, but I knew that if I was to keep myself and Clementine fed through the coming years, the garden would have to become my mainstay. That afternoon I staggered back up the dirt road to the cottage, backpack heavy with every volume on botany I could find. The rest of the week saw me raiding the home and garden store for tools, supplies, and seeds. My life began to take on a rhythm. Mornings were for laboring in the garden, afternoons for trips into town. I visited the grocery, the home and garden store, and the library, in that order. I took only five books at a time, the lending system's limit. The library was a public trust, and just because there was no longer a public didn't mean I had the right to abuse it. I came into town every day, save Sunday. Like God in Genesis, I took the seventh day to rest from my labors and enjoy the fruits of my garden. The weather was growing warmer, and I would sit on the front porch rocking chair with a library book, absently scratching Clementine's head as she purred happily in my lap. One bright afternoon in early May, I was followed home. The sunshine filtered down through the leaves overhead, and the muddy lane leading from the cottage to town had long since baked into a dusty trail. Everything was quiet. Not a breath of wind stirred the branches of trees. No birdsong could be heard. Perhaps that was why the sudden rustle of leaves in the hedgerows to my right caught my attention. I paused, resting against my walking stick, and peered into the bushes. A figure crouched on the other side, just a dim shape in the shade. "'I see you,' I said loudly and clearly. "'Come out now.' Another rustling of leaves and branches shook the bushes. My heart started beating very fast. It had been months since I had seen or spoken to another person. My thoughts flashed back to the first day I had raided the grocery store and the scare I had gotten from the cat inside. Just as I had been on that day, I was alone and unarmed. The figure emerged from the bushes and stumbled onto the dusty road like a sailor emerging from a long voyage, swaying unsteadily on her sneakered feet. She could not have been more than ten years old, with a faint dusting of freckles across her cheeks. The twigs and leaves tangled in her frizzy orange curls made her hair look like a deranged bird's nest. She had a gun. It was an old rifle, the kind my father had hunted with when I was small. Its wooden stock had gotten tangled in the hedge, and the girl turned around, straining to dislodge it. Beads of perspiration formed on her brow. I cleared my throat. <clears> throat> Hello there! Apparently, having forgotten my presence, the girl whirled around. Her momentum tugged free the entangled rifle, and she lost her balance entirely. She pirouetted comically in the air, then landed hard on her rump, sending up a small explosion of dust. I took a step towards her. Are you all right? The business end of the rifle emerged from the dust, wavering in what might charitably be deemed my general direction. Don't come any closer, she shouted, then coughed. I have a gun. I can see that. Are you going to shoot me with it? I don't know. She sat up, the rifle stock resting in her lap. Are you a bad person? I don't think so, I told her. Or at least I hope not. What's your name? Madison. She wrinkled her nose. Not Maddie, though. I hate being called Maddie. I'll remember that, I said. Madison, are you alone out here? She sat in the dust and thought it over. Despite the heat of the afternoon, she wore a sand-colored trench coat. Clearly meant for an adult, the voluminous garment practically buried her in its folds. No, Madison said at last. She stood and leaned against the rifle like it was a walking stick. My dad's with me, and my older brothers, five of them. They're all really mean. I see, I said, not believing her for a moment. Apocalypse or not, no responsible parent would let their ten-year-old wander the countryside with a gun taller than she was. What about you? she asked. What's your name? My name's Evelyn. 
I live in a cottage a half mile down the lane. Madison chewed her lip. All by yourself? Yes. C could I? She looked up at me, pale eyes shining. Could, could we go there, do you think? Would that be okay? That depends, I said. Are you going to shoot me? You haven't said. Oh, right. She looked at the rifle, then back at me. No, I don't think so. That's good, I said. In that case, come along. She slung the rifle over her shoulder, stumbling a little as the weight of the thing threw her off balance. Together we set off down the lane toward the cottage. I like your coat, I told her once we were inside, and I'd put the kettle on. It makes you look like Dick Tracy. Who? Madison asked from the kitchen table. Never mind. I fished around in the cupboards until I found a pair of teacups and set them in front of her. Tea will be ready in a minute. Thanks. Her pale eyes wandered across the modest cabin, taking in the bookshelves, the hand-spun rugs, the second-hand furniture. This is your home? It is. Do you like it? Yes, she said in that decisive tone of utter conviction only children possess. It feels very cozy. I smiled. It is. Was it always yours? Madison asked. Before, I mean... She did not need to specify what she meant by before. Not always, I said. My wife and I bought it many years ago. You have a wife? Madison asked. The kettle whistled. I turned away so that she couldn't see my face. She's only a child, I reminded myself as I poured boiling water over the tea bags. She doesn't know. Yes, I said, putting Madison's tea down in front of her. I went to the mantelpiece and took down the framed photo from our wedding day. Here. I handed her the photo. Daisy and I, many years younger, standing on a beach with the sun just peeking over the waters behind us. We had both eschewed bridal white in favor of sunrise colors. Orange for Daisy, purple for me. Oh, wow, Madison said, her eyes going wide. You're both really pretty. My smile returned. Thanks. Where is she now? Madison asked. The boldness of youth. She's gone. I was surprised to find that my throat did not close up when I said it. Oh, Madison said very quietly. I'm sorry. Thank you, I said. Would you like to see where she's buried? Sunlight and spring had served the garden well. The flowers were in full bloom, the tomatoes ripening on their vines. Bees buzzed cheerfully from blossom to blossom, and the sweet smell of pollen filled the air. Wow! Madison turned in a slow circle, taking it all in. This is like something out of a book. A secret garden, I agreed. This way. The mud on Daisy's grave had since been seeded with grass. There was no headstone, but her flowers swayed gently in the breeze. It's nice, Madison said putting her hands in the pockets of her oversized trench coat. I like the flowers. Thank you. I was about to tell her that they were daisies, because she had been named Daisy, but a rustle in the bushes diverted Madison's attention entirely. Kitty! she shouted, rushing over. Clementine's back arched and she sprang away, alarmed at the sudden onrush of this small human. My cat raced behind me, eyeing the newcomer warily from between my legs. Easy, I said. Madison squatted, trench coat pooling out around her. She put one hand out. Come here. I looked down at Clementine, looking up at me. I shrugged. Clementine stalked cautiously forward, a paw at a time. Madison waited patiently, hand extended. Clementine sniffed Madison's fingers, then nuzzled her cheek against them, eliciting a little squeak of delight. What's her name? Clementine. I sat on the damp grass beside them, scratching my old cat's soft head. Listen, Madison, is your dad out there looking for you? She looked at me blankly. My dad? Him, and your five brothers, remember? Oh she said, flushing. Right, um, no, they're not looking for me, not right now. 
Okay, I said. Then would you like to stay here? Just for tonight. Are you sure? Madison looked at me, absently scratching Clementine under the chin as she considered. I don't want to be any trouble. I'd be glad of the company. So would Clementine. Clementine meowed her affirmation. Madison laughed. Okay, just for tonight. Evelyn? Madison said one night, a week later. Hmm? I looked up from Gulliver's Travels. We had just gotten to the part where the fearful Lilliputians turned against poor Gulliver. I'm sorry about the gun. Madison chewed her lip, staring thoughtfully into the fire. When we first met, I mean. That's all right. I wasn't really going to shoot you. I know that, dear. There aren't even any bullets. Lucky for me. I had checked the weapon the first night after I had tucked her in on the couch. The chamber was as empty as a miser's purse. The trigger rusted away. I just... Madison trailed off. I waited. There are bad people out there, she said at last. I was afraid you might be one. I'm glad you're not. Me too. I shuffled closer to her end of the couch. Have you met any? Bad people? She shook her head. Not up close, at least, but I've seen them. Men, mostly. Some women, too. Fighting with each other. Taking things from each other. I nodded. Near here? No, Madison said. The last time I saw anybody else was weeks before I came here. She chewed her lip. I think they're all gone by now. Bad people don't live very long. Neither do good ones, I said before I could stop myself. Madison didn't say anything. We were silent for a long time, just staring into the fire side by side on my worn-out couch. No, she said at last. I could see the firelight reflecting off her damp cheeks. I guess not. Another silence, this one even longer. I lied about my dad, too, Madison said, not looking at me. Her voice sounded raw. He's gone. I know. I put my arm around her. I didn't ask her about her five mean brothers. They were as fictional as the Lilliputians. Clementine jumped up onto the couch and curled into a ball between us, purring softly. Madison stroked the cat's back, running her hand along the delicate ridges of her spine. "'Just the three of us,' I murmured. "'You can stay here as long as you want, you know.' Her eyes shone in the firelight. "'You're sure?' "'Yes. I like having you around, Madison. So does Clementine.' She let out a choking sound, half sob and half laugh. Then she burrowed her head into my shoulder and cried. I held her tightly in my arms, the way I wished someone had held me when Daisy died. I stroked her hair gently and rubbed her shoulders, whispering that it would be all right, that she would not be alone again. Eventually she fell asleep, her tear-stained cheeks resting against my leg. Clementine curled up beneath one arm. I looked at the wedding photo where it sat above the fire. Our faces smiled widely at me, mine and Daisy's. Thank you, I told my wife, and fell asleep with the child in my arms. Time ticked on. Everything I did, Madison did with me. I taught her what I knew of cooking, of gardening, of washing dishes and cleaning the home. In return, she told me stories as we worked books I had never read, movies and television shows I had never seen and never would see. I did not mind. I liked hearing her talk and suspected that I derived much more enjoyment listening to Madison's rendition of the latest and final Pixar film than I ever would seeing the real thing. I was careful to keep her by my side when we went into town. I had explored most of the main street and many of the surrounding neighborhoods, but by now I was confident that no one else in the area had survived the bombs. But confidence is not the same as surety, and I was responsible for Madison's safety. She still carried the useless old rifle with her everywhere, still wore the oversized trench coat. I did not question her on either account. I knew without asking that they had belonged to her father. We are all entitled to our talismans if they bring us some measure of comfort. 
After weeks spent venturing into their domain, the cats roaming the streets had grown accustomed to us. They would keep pace as we explored the deserted streets, strolling along in that aloof manner that suggested they weren't following us, but that we just happened to be heading in the same direction as them. By summer's end, some had grown brave enough to come within arm's reach, though they still shied away if either of us tried to pet them. The seasons marched implacably onward from a hot, dry summer to a bitter, windy autumn. Mornings were spent winterizing the garden, carefully preserving our modest plot of vegetables against the coming frost. As the days shortened, we spent the daylight hours splitting logs for firewood until both my hands and hers thickened with calluses. Our forays into town became a weekly rather than a daily affair. By now we had filled the storm cellar with more than enough food to see us through to spring. Basic tools and supplies we had in abundance, but I wanted to make sure we were provided for. One trip saw us return home laden with winter clothes and spare boots, and the following week we stumbled home half buried in quilts and blankets. We made the last of these visits at the end of November, struggling against the blustering wind and an early dusting of snow. This final trip was an expedition for the only remaining supplies we would need before the snows confined us to the cabin for months. The library was dark, but we had brought flashlights with us. I found a book on pickling food, since I knew the tinned goods would not last forever. After some perusing, I filled my backpack with every Shakespeare I could find. Madison had taken to acting out the stories we read together each night, and I wanted to start her on the bard. "'What do you think for tonight?' I asked, holding up two dog-eared copies of Macbeth and As You Like It. "'Comedy or tragedy?' No answer. I turned around. No Madison. Madison? My voice echoed her name back at me from the rows of bookshelves. Panic rose in my throat. I had let her out of my sight just for a minute, but sometimes a minute makes all the difference in the world. Madison! This time her voice answered me, though I could not understand the muffled words. I raced down the darkened aisles until I found her kneeling beside a pile of battered paperbacks. I wanted to cry with relief and anger, but Madison held up one finger to her lips, forestalling my reaction, and pointed at the pile of books. Some had fallen against a nearby shelf, forming a literary cave. I knelt and looked inside. Two glimmering green eyes peered back out at me. The cat poked her head out, sniffed my fingers. I held my breath and stayed as still as I could. Satisfied with my smell, she rubbed her cheeks along my fingers, scenting me, and then surprised me by head-butting my hand. "'Sweet girl,' I murmured, scratching her behind the ears. "'How did you find her?' "'I was looking for comic books,' Madison grinned. I heard her meowing. The cat stepped fully out of the mulch and rubbed against my legs, purring. Her coat was a stripy orange. Her swollen belly hung low, visibly pregnant. Can we take her home? Madison asked. I almost said no automatically, but something stopped me. I thought back to Daisy, to how mad I had gotten when she had first brought Clementine home. But Clementine had saved my life. Because she had, I had taken in Madison. Once, I had had only Daisy. Now I was building a family. Well, I said, half to Madison and half to myself, we can't leave her alone here, can we? That was how Harlequin came to live with us. I told Madison she would be an early Christmas present over her delighted squeals. I reminded her of the burdens of pet ownership and impressed upon her that when the kittens came, they too would be her responsibility. I might as well have been talking to the sky. The moment Madison put Harlequin into her coat, the mama cat curled up against her chest and licked her face with her sandpapery pink tongue. Madison laughed, and I knew there would be no parting the two of them. Tragedy still strikes, even after the world has ended. Clementine was old for a cat, and the chill got into her bones. Her movements became slow and sluggish. She did not seem pained, just tired. 
The last time she showed any real energy was the day we had brought Harlequin home. She had walked up to the strange cat in her home, tail held high. The two of them had sniffed each other, then circled one another warily for several minutes before deciding by mutual agreement to ignore one another completely. The next morning we found them curled up together on the couch. Our goodbye was sudden, as all goodbyes are. Clementine had spent most of December in front of the fire or stretched out on our laps. She slept nearly all day and night, paws resting beneath her chin. On Christmas Eve, her breathing became labored, and she let out small cries and mules from her place by the fire. Madison and I sat with her, petting her gently as the quiet hum of her heartbeat grew steadily slower. "'Is she hurt?' Madison asked softly. No, I said, fighting to keep my voice steady. Just tired, I think. Will she be okay? At that, I could only shrug. It's her time. Madison buried her face in Clementine's neck. Clementine purred as she cried. We slept together, all four of us, Madison and I, with Clementine curled up between us. Harlequin bathing the older cat like one of the kittens she was soon to have. The last thing I felt before an exhausted sleep claimed me was Clementine, purring with all the strength remaining in her small, fragile body. In the morning, she was cold. We buried Clementine on Christmas Day beside her mother. Her grave was smaller and shallower and took less time to dig, though the packed earth was frozen over but I had Madison to help me this time. We buried her with her collar and one of her favorite toys. Madison cried only a little, having spent most of her tears that night. I cried a lot, unable to help, feeling that I was somehow burying the last piece of Daisy with her. Harlequin had three kittens in the spring, two boys, one lively and orange, the other soft and black, and a tiny girl with fine sandy fur. Madison fell in love with all three immediately and completely. "'Have you thought of names for them yet?' I asked her one fine spring morning, a year after the world had ended. The kittens were romping through the yard, their stubby tails held high. "'I have,' Madison said seriously. She pointed. "'The orange one's going to be called Gulliver.' "'After the book?' Madison nodded. I always pictured Gulliver with orange hair, and his brother will be Clement, like Clementine, but a boy. A lump rose in my throat, and I turned away. Madison pretended not to notice. And their sister? I asked, once I had recovered myself. I pointed at the small, blonde ball of fur wandering over the garden's two graves. Do you have a name for her? I do. Madison went to the flowers that shaded my wife's grave plucked one. She came over to me and carefully placed it behind my ear. She smiled her freckly, gap-tooth grin as she surveyed her handiwork. Well? I was smiling, too. Daisy, Madison said. Her name is Daisy. And we're back. There's a famous American political ad from the 1960s, commonly referred to as the Daisy ad, that features a little girl playing with a daisy right before a nuclear bomb goes off. This story is almost the opposite of that ad. It starts with an apocalypse and ends with a girl and daisies. Marshall had this to say, This is a story dealing with grief both on the macro, civilization-ending war, and micro, death of a loved one, scale. When I was 17, my dad died very suddenly of an unexpected heart attack. He was only 50 years old and in good health. Dad was my hero and my idol, and in some ways my entire adult life has been a prolonged process of learning to live with that grief. This is also a story about the redemptive, saving grace of love, even that of an animal. I suffer from severe anxiety over the global climate catastrophe. On days where I am overcome with hopelessness over our planet's future, 
The companionship and love of my family, friends, and cats reminds me that none of us, human or feline, chose to be born into this world, and all we can do is strive to make one another's lives as kind, safe, and loving as possible. Many of us have probably lost someone we loved in recent years, and I agree wholeheartedly with Marshall here. I'd just like to add that in addition to showing kindness and love to others, we should also remember to be patient with ourselves. Oh, and remember Marshall's super cuddly cat Furiosa from the intro? Furiosa was almost named Clementine, which is where he got the name for the cat in Daisies. For cat pictures, cat story recommendations, and more, follow Cats Cats Pod on Twitter. We'd love to hear from you there or on the Escape Artist Discord server, Facebook, or Instagram. Today's cover art is based on a photo of Sophie by Diane Adams, who writes, Sophie was a stray who ended up in a shelter after chasing off a dog attacking her three young kittens. We adopted her and one of her daughters. After almost three years in our home, she is finally settling into allowing us to pamper her. We'll be back in September with episode 6 on the Escape Artist Premium content feed, and in October with episode 7 and a special Halloween episode on both feeds. In the meantime, you can find more narrative goodness on our weekly sister podcasts, Escape Artist for Science Fiction, Podcastle for Fantasy, Pseudopod for Horror, and Cast of Wonders for YA. Marshall has a book coming out this fall, and he sent me a blurb. I would have read it here, but I didn't think I could quite do it justice, so I asked Dave Robison for help. In the city of Albastine, the dead are made into mindless servants known as attendants, incapable of harming the living, unless commanded to by the soldier necromancer legates. Forced into an early retirement, Legate Gaius Cassius Calvus struggles to find purpose in his civilian life until he is called upon to examine the apparent suicide of one of Albastine's senators. Caius's necromantic powers reveal that the man was murdered and that the weapon used to kill him was an attendant. Knowing that only another legate can command an attendant to kill, Caius sets out to discover the truth behind the assassination. His investigation leads him through the foggy streets and brooding towers of Albastine as he slowly uncovers a conspiracy that threatens to shake the pale city to its very foundations. Should he fail, the republic he has sworn his life and death to serve falls with him. Look for The Pale City by Marshall J. Moore, coming fall 2022 from Shadow Alley Press. Today's episode is brought to you by audio producers Wilson Fowley and Dave Robison, associate editors Kitty Sarkozy and Tarva Nova, and me, editor Laura Perlman. Our opening and closing music is Easy Lemon by Kevin McLeod. Cat's Cast is a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and is brought to you with a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. Don't change it, don't sell it, please do share it. Cat's Cast relies on listener donations, so thank you so much if you've already donated. You can support us and all the other EA podcasts by donating via patreon.com slash EA podcasts or through the website escapeartist.net. You can also help us out by leaving a review or rating at Apple Podcasts or wherever you normally leave those things. Cat's Cast is distributed monthly on the Escape Artist premium content feed. A separate public Cat's Cast feed gets a subset of those episodes. More details can be found in the show notes or at escapeartist.net slash catscast. Thanks for listening, and until next time, keep in touch! <laughs>